Good evening and a warm welcome. Uh, I'm Robert Dygraaf. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study and the Leon Levy professor here. Uh, no apologies for the weather. I would say yet another perfectly fine Dutch fall day. Uh, but some of you must have felt that you were crossing the Red Sea uh, to get to this lecture here. Uh, in that vein, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's public lecture on the archaeology and history of Jerusalem and Biblical Times by Israel Finkelstein, uh, who is the Jacob M. Elko Professor at Archaeology of Israel in the Bronze and Iron Ages at Tel Aviv University. Uh, and we have a little bit like a Russian doll, so I will be actually just introducing the uh, introducer here. Uh, but uh, before I do that, I would like to convey the answer deepest thanks to uh, Jeanette uh, Lerman Neubauer, who, uh, our dear trustee, who's here in the audience with her uh, husband, Joe. Jeanette, it was you who reached out to Dr. Finkelstein and made this evening possible. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to recognize another trustee here, uh, Shelby White, who has also a very long uh, relation with the speaker and very happy to have you here, Shelby. The study of Greek and Roman history in ancient cultures has a long and important uh, history here at the Institute, this particularly the School of Historical Studies. It uh, started in, uh, in 1935, at the very beginning, when Benjamin Barrett was appointed Professor of Greek Epigraphy. Archaeology was added in the following year by the appointment of Hattie Goldman, who was also our first uh, woman as professor, and was Latin Paleography, with the appointment of Lowe. And then later, Eastern archaeology came uh, under the aegis of Ernst Hertzfeld. Uh, from the foundation, the strong and diverse program in Greek and Roman studies was built up. And after the Second World War, Homer Thompson took over as professor of Greek archaeology in 1947. With the retirement of merit, Christian Habicht came to the institute, became professor of Greek history, and as re assumed responsibility for our extensive collection of squeezes these three-dimensional impressions of ancient impressions. And of course, we all dearly miss uh, Professor Habe, who passed away this summer. Uh, Merit had built up this uh, major research center here in Greek epigraphy at the IES, and uh, we are very proud of that. By the way, initiative to digitize this institute's quiz selection is currently underway with generous gifts provided by uh, institute friend Annette Merle Smith and the Charles and Lisa Simoni Fund for Arts and Sciences. So I would say the strong tradition of study in the ancient world continues with uh, Angelos Kaniotis, who has been serving here as the school's professor since 2010. He is very much active here at the Institute across the world. Though strong suspension, he's suspicions, he's a part of a triplet, uh, given this range of activities. Uh, but I also would like to thank, uh, well, both thank Angelos and Nathan Arrington, uh, associate professor in the program of archeology span at Princeton University for co-organizing tonight's lecture. And with these brief words, let me welcome the true introducer, Angelos Kaniotis. Thank you. There was a time when people believed that they knew the exact date of the creation of the world. Although there was some controversy about it, whether it was the 1st of September of 5509, according to the Christian calendar, or October 6, 3761, according to the Hebrew calendar. Then science came and suggested that this calculation might be wrong by several billion years if we think of the Big Bang, or several, several million years if we consider the emergence of life. There was a time when the history of Israel, and more generally the Near East, was based on facts given in the Bible. For instance, on narratives about the Exodus or the great kingdom ruled by David and Solomon that was later split into the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And then archeological research came confronting the historical scenarios of the Bible with the data provided by excavations and asking uncomfortable questions. Was there ever an exodus? What kind of a kingdom David and Solomon ruled? Was there a monotheistic religion in Israel in the late Bronze and early Iron Age? There was a time when a discipline that sought to unearth remains of material culture in the Near East was labeled biblical archeology. span 
And then the cooperation between archaeological research and the natural, life, and exact sciences came, transforming an archaeological discipline from a servant of Old Testament studies, from the archaeology of a text, to the archaeology of human beings. One of the leading figures in the formation of modern Bronze and early Iron Age archaeology in Israel is our speaker, Israel Finkelstein, the Jacob Alcock Professor of the Archaeology of Israel in the Bronze and Iron Ages at Tel Aviv University, where he has been teaching since 1990 after holding professorial positions at Bar Ilan University and the University of Chicago. Professor Finkelstein's field work is extremely impressive, including excavations of Bronze and Early Iron Age sites near Tel Aviv, in the Sinai, in the Beersheba Valley, and surveys in the south and Samaria. But his most important long-term projects are the excavation of the city of Megiddo for 25 years now, one of the most important sites in the Levant, and a key site for understanding the late second and the early first millennia BC. And more recently, the excavations of sites in the Negev Highlands. For decades, Professor Finkelstein has been a pioneer in the use of diverse scientific methods for the analysis of archaeological finds. He was a principal investigator of the project Reconstructing Ancient Israel, the Exact and Life Sciences Perspectives, that was funded by the European Research Council from 2009 to 2014. In addition to numerous monographs in which he presented in an exemplary manner the results of his numerous excavations, he has written two best-selling books for a general audience together with Neil Asher Zilberman, The Bible Unearthed, Archaeology's New Vision of Ancient Israel and the Origin of its Sacred Text, 2001, and David and Solomon, in search of the Bible's sacred kings and the roots of the Western tradition in 2006. He has received many honors for his research, including membership in the Israel Academy of Sciences and the Humanities and the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres as a correspondant étranger, the Dan David Prize for his, for his radical revision of the history of Israel in the 10th and 9th centuries BCE in 2005, in 2009, he was made Chevalier in the Order of Arts and Letters in France. And I stop here. Uh, he's also, uh, he also holds an honorary degree from the uh, University of Lausanne. The popular image of an archaeologist has been informed by the Indiana Jones movies. <laughs> and indeed, in real archaeological excavations, there is plenty of romance. There are snakes and scorpions, there are mysteries to be solved, and sometimes also treasures to be found. But there are also fist fights? Yes, there are, although only in a metaphorical sense, taking place in the pages of books, in newspapers, and blogs. When new radical interpretations are proposed, they are not accepted without a fight. Unsurprisingly, Professor Finkelstein's reconstruction of the early history of Israel has not found followers among people who are more willing to trust an ideologically colored book written by human hand than the results of scholarly and scientific research. But his research has transformed the way we now view and study the early history of the Levant, and today he will be speaking on Jerusalem in biblical times. After his lecture, there will be the possibility for you to ask questions. Please join me in welcoming Professor Israel Finkelstein. Thank you very much, uh, Angelos, for uh, this introduction, and thank you all for coming in this uh, stormy weather today. And uh, many thanks to the Institute for inviting me to this uh, fascinating place and for the wonderful treat here while I'm at Princeton. Uh, I am uh, not uh, going to speak about every detail in the history and archaeology of Jerusalem this evening. I will uh, basically uh, outline several important uh, uh, notes um, about the history of this uh, uh, wonderful city, very central to our civilization in the period of time between the Late Bronze Age and the Hellenistic period in the late second century BC. 
So uh, before we start with actual history and archaeology, let me say a few words of introduction in order to introduce the site, the place to you, for those of you who uh, may have not been in Jerusalem. So uh, uh, Jerusalem, from the topography point of view, is divided into three uh, major uh, parts. The Temple Mount is the highest point of the old city of Jerusalem. The old city of Jerusalem, this picture was taken in the 1930s, and I find it uh, very illuminating because it is not disturbed by the urban complex of now, of modern days. So the Temple Mount in the center, to the south of the Temple Mount, there's this uh, ridge which is known in archaeological research as the City of David. I always say, quote unquote, the City of David, because the City of David is a term that we do find in the Bible, however, we do not exactly know where it is. So it's an, a, a, a kind of sort of an interpretation of biblical scholars that this is the place. And then to the um, west of the Temple Mount, there's the uh, upper city, a term taken from Second Temple Jerusalem, uh, the Jewish quarter of today, which was part of the Iron Age city at a certain time. So these are the three components. And then, of course, this, there is the spring, which I mark here in the valley of the Kidron, the spring, which is the life of Jerusalem, Jerusalem being located on the desert fringe. In fact, uh, uh, if one walks about one kilometer from uh, the Temple Mount to the east, one finds himself, herself in the desert, on the desert fringe. Then uh, let me say a few words about ecological research in Jerusalem, I, because this reflects on what I'm going to tell you, because I mean the evidence that I'm going to present is based indeed on many excavations and uh, in even local small investigations. So I suppose that I will not exaggerate much if I say that the city of David, again quote unquote, is uh, probably the most excavated piece of land on the face of the earth. It is about 350 meters long, 400 meters long. In some places, it is 60, 70 meters broad, not more than that. And almost every part of it has been excavated during the last, what can I say, 130 years or so. So the accumulation of evidence, archaeological evidence, for this part of Jerusalem is very solid and impressive. The question, the most important question that we are facing is the location of uh, the Mount of Jerusalem. We are all used to those uh, features uh, in the, out there in the Levant, the mounds, the tells, uh, the accumulation of many centuries of human activity and with many layers one on top of the other. And we are looking also for the mound of the site of uh, Jerusalem. But this is a major problem because the city of David has been considered by many as the place, as the mound of biblical Jerusalem, also the Bronze Age city of Jerusalem, which is mentioned in the 14th century in Egyptian um, documents from the time of um, Amenophis III and Amenophis IV, the pharaohs, during the Amarna period. So uh, is this the place? Is this the mound of Jerusalem? This is a very critical question for what I'm going to say next. And my answer is that there are many very serious problems regarding this identification, and I'm putting them here on the, uh, on the screen. First of all, uh, most uh, phases in the Bronze and Iron Ages are uh, not represented uh, along the ridge of the city of David, again, which has been considered as the Mount of Ancient Jerusalem. And then, even more so, periods for which we have solid evidence of habitation in Jerusalem and as an important place are not represented. First and foremost, let's put our, uh, uh, pay attention to the 14th century BC. Jerusalem then was a hub of a city-state which corresponded with Egyptian authorities, the imperial Egyptian authorities of the time. We even know the name of the monarch, petty monarch in Jerusalem. However, along the ridge of the city of David, there are no finds, or almost no finds from this period. Uh, also, most of the finds are only near the springs, and uh, most of the periods are not represented in other parts of the ridge. And then there is a problem of uh, no city wall. I'll return to this one in parts of uh, around 
or on part of the ridge of the city of David, and then there is also the topographical issue. Uh, it is not well located topographically. So let me give you an example. For instance, uh, let's have a look at this nice picture taken to the north with the Temple Mount uh, and Al-Aqsa Mosque in the background. We can see that there are fortifications on the eastern side of the ridge of the city of David. However, 130 and more years of excavations in Jerusalem have not revealed any trace of fortification on the western side. And this is quite annoying from uh, if, one, if one tries to understand the nature of the site and decide that uh, Jerusalem should be, the Mount of Jerusalem should be located on the, te on the, uh, on the city of David uh, ridge. Secondly is the topographical issue. This is a picture that I took maybe a year ago, just while uh, walking down to the city of David after, after parking my car uh, near the wall of the old city of today. And you can see the uh, topographical inferiority of the ridge from all sides, from all four sides. And of course, though in antiquity, in the Bronze and Iron Ages, they did not have mortars and guns, Still, it is a topographical inferiority that we have to take into consideration when we come to decide about the location of the uh, ancient mound. So, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, with some of my colleagues at Tel Aviv University, we revived the old uh, theory that, in fact, uh, suggested by several scholars recently, 20 years ago, by a German biblical scholar, Axel Knauf, that in fact the Mount of Ancient Jerusalem should be sought for uh, on the Temple Mount. So uh, is this uh, uh, possible? This is a picture of the Temple Mount, again in the 1930s, looking to the south. The only disadvantage is that the Temple Mount is a little bit away from the water, from the spring. However, it is in a very good location from the topographic point of view, and there is enough space, I'm marking here with the uh, yellow uh, sign, yellow circle, there's enough space there for, to plant, so to speak, a mound. The typical mounds in the highlands uh, uh, of the Near East are about, say, five, six, the bigger ones are about five or six hectares in size. And here I have just planted a tell of about five or six hectares on the Temple Mount, showing you that there is enough space because the uh, platform of the Temple Mount, as we see today, the creation of King Herod the Great in the first century BC is about 450 meters long and 250 50 meters wide. So there's enough space here for uh, a mound. And uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, it is impossible to excavate on the Temple Mount unless one of you really wishes to have the Third World War tomorrow morning which I uh, am not suggesting here. So there is no way to excavate on the Temple Mount. The sensitivities are there from all communities, both on the uh, Muslim side and on the Jewish side. So this is not something that can be done in the foreseen future. Uh, and if, even if uh, there was a possibility to excavate on the Temple Mount, I doubt very much if much would have been uh, uh, recognized because of the immense work undertaken there by King Herod the Great in the first century BC, which probably simply eradicated most of the remains that were there before him in this uh, complex uh, construction uh, of uh, his own uh, temple, the second temple uh, in the history of Jerusalem. So if this is the case, and the Mount of Jerusalem is on the Temple Mount, which as you'll, be, as, as you'll see soon, is going to be a very, uh, well, it's good news because it's going to solve some of the uh, problems. I can always say, well, we don't have evidence, so the evidence is there in the Temple Mount. This is a good solution, maybe. Uh, but there are also some uh, very monumental remains near the spring. So the question is how to understand, for instance, in this picture that uh, you can see now on the screen, these are very monumental middle bronze fortifications around the spring. So how to understand this if the town the itself, with probably palace and temple, is about 300 meters away? I would say, and I think that even in the last few weeks, there's more evidence for this in Jerusalem, because in Jerusalem there's always an excavation going on, and you always uh, need to be with your hand on the pulse in order to uh, be up to date 
uh, with your interpretation of the fines. So I think that there is good evidence for uh, fortresses which were built um, uh, up uh, above the spring in order to protect the spring, even if these fortresses were a little bit away from the main uh, part of the city. Finally, before going into the details, let me just say a word about chronology. Because as uh, Angelo said before, many of us until 30, 40 years ago were in the business of dating the monuments according to uh, our understanding of biblical verses. However, this uh, proved to be a, a problematic uh, way of dealing with the chronology of the Levant. Uh, more and more information accumulated in the, I would say, 70s and 80s to put a question mark on this kind of interpretation. And uh, about, what can I say, 20 years ago, we all turned, or most of us turned, to radiocarbon dating. And today we uh, are all uh, radiocarbon ruled, so to speak, or dictated, so to speak. And what I'm showing you here is the framework for the uh, chronology of the monuments, Iron Age monuments in the Levant, which um, is radiocarbon dated. This is from an article that uh, I published with a colleague from Tel Aviv University in the journal Antiquity about uh, eight years ago or so. So we are dating according to this in order to, according to one's interpretation of this or that bib biblical verse. So now we are done with the introduction and I'm going to speak about uh, four phases in the history of Jerusalem. They are presented to you on the screen. So the formative phase until the middle of the ninth century the first leap forward, I call it, from the middle of the 19th century until the middle of the 8th. Then a fully developed capital of territorial kingdom from the second half of the 8th century until the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 586. And then I have a comment on the period which followed. So let me start with this one, with the formation phase, formative phase, sorry, until the middle of the 9th century. So in the late Bronze Age, as I mentioned before, we are in a big problem because we have um, uh, written sources, the Amarna letters uh, of the 14th century BC telling us that Jerusalem was an important place. It was a hub of a city-state and the king was a, a, you know, a major figure in the politics of Canaan at that time, corresponding with the pharaohs and also trying to be involved in the politics of uh, regions which are far away from Jerusalem. However, in the city of David uh, and near the spring, there are almost no remains from this period. So there is no escape, in my opinion, then arguing that the mound was again on the Temple Mount over there. And this is the beginning of Jerusalem in the Bronze Age, in the second millennium, perhaps even in the third millennium BC. As you can see uh, on the left of the picture, one of the Amarna tablets, of Jerusalem, and the, the map showing you that the countryside of Jerusalem is still very sparsely uh, inhabited at the time. And this situation continued also in the Iron Age, beginning of the Iron Age, which means, let's say that the transition from the late bronze to the Iron Age is around the middle of the, or the end of the 12th century BC. So um, in the 11th century, in the beginning of the 10th century, this was the situation, continuing of the same uh, uh, conditions. Uh, the only change is the intensif a slight intensification of settlement activity in the highlands of Jerusalem. Because we, when we come to reconstruct history, we always need to take a look at the city, at the center, but also the countryside. Because the relationship between center and the periphery, the countryside is highly important for our understanding of a location like this. And the, indeed, it should not come as a big surprise that when we do have the first extra biblical evidence for a canon, I would call it still, of the 10th century, there is no trace of Jerusalem or Judah. I am referring here to the list of places taken over by Pharaoh Shoshank I, the founder of the 22nd dynasty in Egypt, left for us on the wall of the Temple of Amun at Karnak in Upper Egypt, and places in the highlands north of Jerusalem are mentioned, and places in the Jezreel Valley, including Megiddo, where I excavate, are mentioned at Megiddo. There's even uh, a broken uh, stele of uh, 
Sheshong uh, I, which was found in, during the excavations of the University of Chicago in the 20s, in fact. However, Jerusalem is not mentioned, neither any uh, city in the highlands of Judah, let's say Hebron, Bethlehem, or in the Shefela, Lachish, Lakish, or other places, nothing is mentioned, apparently signaling to us that this was not yet a very important part uh, to uh, raise the appetite of the Egyptian monarch who came to Canaan in order to try re-establish the great uh, kingdom of his forefathers of the um, uh, new kingdom. So on this background, we have to ask a question because Sheshong came to Canaan in the second half of the 10th century and we are there in the time of David and Solomon. So what was the nature of the city in the time of David and Solomon, the founders of the uh, biblically described great united monarchy of Israel? And indeed there was an immense effort by uh, archaeologists uh, in the last, what, century or so to identify monuments from the time of, King, of, of David and Solomon between, because this was the key to present evidence on the ground for this fabulous golden age of ancient Israel in the 10th century BC, biblically described in such a beautiful way in the books of uh, Samuel and in the books of Kings, in the book of Kings. And in the last 20 or 30 years, there were three monuments which were presented to the, pub, to the scholarly community and to the public as evidence for the great united monarchy of David and Solomon. I'm showing you here on the left-hand side the uh, great uh, stone structure excavated by our colleague Elat Mazar um, and identified as the palace of King David. And on the right-hand side up you can see the stepped stone structure, which is some sort of a revetment, a support for this building on the left. And the two of them were presented as evidence for the great united monarchy. Here is the reconstruction of Elat Mazar and other scholars showing the uh, support on the slope, because the slope is very steep over there, or, and the spring is down below, and the palace and the building. And here on the right-hand side is even a better reconstruction of how some scholars see the situation. However, when we, you know, the, we archaeologists have the uh, bad temper of looking into details, and uh, this is devastating sometimes, and uh, in this case, in fact, when one looks very carefully into the details of, you know, boring facts such as elevations and foundations and pottery and ceramics and then radiocarbon dates and so on, the situation becomes more and more complex. And in fact, I think that there is strong evidence that we are dealing with structures which uh, could not have been built before the 9th century BC. And I think the evidence is quite solid. So here we are again with the same question, since uh, most of us, me included, do not doubt the historicity of David and Solomon as the founders of the kingdom of Judah and the house of David, the Davidic dynasty, in Jerusalem, we are again in a situation now, <laughs> I would say we are in a better situation now than 10 years ago, because now we can point to the Temple Mount and say, well, maybe uh, the core of the city is there. So it was not a big city, it was not a fabulous golden age, but there was something there. I'm saying this, that there was no big city on the Temple Mount because though it is impossible to excavate on the Temple Mount, we do have evidence from there. How is that? There uh, have been several uh, archaeological works conducted, I'll speak about it in a few minutes from now, around the Temple Mount. And on the slopes of the tem Temple Mount, one could really uh, expect to find the shared evidence, pottery evidence, that would give you some sort of, in, of an idea about the settlement history of the supposed mound on top of the hill. And when one looks at the finds, uh, one sees that uh, the major periods in the history of Jerusalem, such as the, let's say, 8th and 7th centuries, and then later the Hellenistic periods, are very well represented. However, the other periods, including the 10th century and the Late Bronze Age, are there, but they are not uh, very strong. So this means that apparently the settlement on top of the hill was modest in size and also in prosperity. Uh, so the same can be said about this structure, which is 
probably also, which also probably represents several phases of um, construction. And I think that uh, the evidence that comes from pottery that was collected from between the courses of the stepped structure give us indication that it could not have been built before the 9th century BC. This brings us to the very intriguing question of uh, the distance between uh, the finds on the ground and wishful thinking. And whenever I go to Jerusalem and I look, I, I took two of the reconstructions for you, but there are uh, other, and those of you who visited the site could see elaborate reconstructions of uh, restoration of how the city should, have been look, should, should, should look like. And I can tell you that uh, much of what you see does not exist, in fact. I mean, it, is all, it all comes from one's interpretation of, uh, not even the interpretation of the biblical text, but understanding what the text must have uh, 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 try to tell us about Jerusalem, something like that. Because, the, for instance, the fortification of Jerusalem does not exist before the 8th century. So here we have a fortification for the 10th century BC. And the fortification for the Temple Mount, and things like this. So this is really interesting, methodologically, when we speak to our students, I'm always showing them this, and I'm telling them, well, here is the distance between what we are doing today and what... Uh, uh, he or she can uh, dream or wish uh, to have about the history of Jerusalem. Still, uh, the Temple Mount uh, 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 should not be forgotten, of course, and we should say up front, I should say up front, that as I mentioned already, that the historicity of the founders of the Davidic dynasty, in my opinion, cannot be doubted, cannot be challenged. And the reason, one of the reasons, there are many reasons for this, but one of the reasons is this inscription that was found uh, 20 years ago or so in the northern site of Dan in Israel, and it, is, it was written by a Damascene monarch, Hazael, who is also mentioned in the Bible, and he was the king of Damascus in the late 9th century and a bitter enemy of the northern kingdom of Israel at the time, and he tells in the inscription how he defeated the king of the northern kingdom, the king of Israel, and then he says, and uh, the king of the house of David, which means he uh, titles the southern uh, kingdom, the southern of the two Hebrew kingdoms, uh, house of David, because he knows that the founder of the dynasty was David. And this is something um, uh, in the genre of the Assyrians, for instance, in some of their inscriptions, referring to the northern kingdom as Bitumri, the house of Omri, which means acknowledging that Omri was the founder of the palace, of the capital, of the main important dynasty of the northern kingdom of Israel, when the two Hebrew kingdoms live side by side. So this inscription is important, and there is no, in my opinion, there is no reason to doubt that there was, you know, the typical uh, Levantine Middle Eastern temple and um, shrine, dynastic shrine, uh, I'm sorry, palace and dynastic shrine on the Temple Mount. So this is something that we cannot prove, of course, for the reasons that I described, but we can assume, I think, quite, sec quite securely. A few words about writing, because this is essential for understanding, in my opinion, of the uh, biblical text and other issues that have to do with culture and material culture. Here, too, there has been a revolution in the last few years. Before, uh, inscriptions were dated. Most of the inscriptions uh, are not found in good context, and they were dated according to assumptions regarding paleography, assumptions when checked in, uh, by running algorithms uh, that compare uh, handwritings on, let's say, Hebrew ostraca, the answer is uh, less than promising regarding the uh, conventional wisdom on uh, the development of uh, 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 Hebrew letters, characters in the Iron Age. And also, now we are into dating the inscriptions according to the archaeological context, if possible, for those possible. What we see in the case of Jerusalem is that there are no inscriptions before, in my opinion, the second half of the ninth century. Some will tell you, will give you an earlier period. But as far as I understand, this is the earliest. It is not even Hebrew yet. It is proto canaanite This is the way we un understand the beginning of alphabetic writing in the Levant. And it is from the second half of the ninth century, telling you that um, uh, Proto-Kenanite lingered 
relatively late until the sec late 9th century in parallel to the rise of Hebrew script, if you wish, in other places. But uh, this carries with it uh, implications to our understanding of the possibilities of um, dating uh, biblical text, and I'm not going to go into this. So we were in the formative period, and let, in, let me now shift from here to the uh, first leap forward, because this is really the moment that something happens, uh, starting in the middle of the ninth century. And this comes from excavations in the last, what? I would say 20 years, not more than that. So let's see, there are three uh, places which have been excavated uh, south of the Temple Mount, south of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and all of them revealed some, sort of, uh, some indication for quite meaningful remains from the, what we call in archaeology the Iron 2A, if I translate it to uh, um, uh, a better term that, uh, to, to understand, I would say the 9th century BC. So here we are. First of all, I'm giving you with a red circle the place. There are the remains that I have already described that are from the 9th century above the spring. Secondly, the second place is not so far from there, maybe 150 meters or so to the northeast. There is another excavation in a place in Jerusalem which is described by archaeologists as the Ophel, another term that comes from the Hebrew Bible, another term that we do not know how to locate really exactly in the topography of ancient Jerusalem. So it's a scholarly invention to identify the Ophel in this place, but as a technical term, it's okay. And here, uh, because a pocket was created between the slope of bedrock and uh, all sorts of um, construction, we have preservation of uh, Iron Age uh, of 9th century remains very impressive. The corner of the a building that you can see over here stands like five meters high. This is a building from probably was constructed in the ninth century BC. So it's a very monumental one. And then the third location is uh, to the south of the Dung Gate. Excavations that uh, um, uh, are going on, still going on, a very interesting place in Jerusalem because this is almost the only last place available for large-scale excavations to reveal the very beginning of Jerusalem's history, if you wish. Uh, and so this is an important place. And down in the bottom on bedrock, in the place that I marked with the circle, with, the, with this ellipse there, uh, 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 nine century remains were found. So altogether, let's have a look. Here we have uh, the, ex the beginning of uh, expansion of Jerusalem. If we speak about a mound of about five hectares, let's say five, six hectares, in the, until the middle of the ninth century, including the time of the, the founders of the Davidic dynasty, now we are speaking about a settlement which is twice as big, which means about nine hectares, something like that. And the part which I mark in red is not yet um, fortified. However, there is reason to suggest that the mound on the mount uh, had already been fortified at that time. And why am I saying this? Because of a chronistic verse in the second book of Kings describing a confrontation between the king of Israel named Joash and the king of uh, Judah named Amatzia. And there the text in a chronistic way, which is probably uh, reliable, I suppose, historically, uh, tells about the defeat of Judah in the hands of Israel, the northern kingdom, and then the northern king comes to Jerusalem and he breaks the wall of Jerusalem. So there is no wall of Jerusalem to break in the ninth century unless the mound on the mount was fortified, and there is a supporting piece of evidence for what I'm saying. Before I will show you the supporting piece of evidence, or let, yeah, we can go right there and then come back. In Judah, in other places in Judah, we do have evidence for 45 towns starting in the 9th century BC. So here is the site of Mitzpah, north of Jerusalem. This is Bet Shemesh, west of Jerusalem, and this is Lachish, southwest of Jerusalem, and they are all heavily fortified already in the second half, apparently, of the 9th century. And together with the expansion of Jerusalem, we see also first indications of uh, maybe more sophisticated uh, administration in this bule that were found near the spring, many of them, about 200 of them. 
they are not inscribed yet, but still they show some sort of administration of uh, bringing shipping commodities to and from uh, Jerusalem. So at the same time, I'm speaking about this first leap forward, which took place starting in the middle of the ninth century. Uh, we also have expansion of settlement activity in the highlands to the south of Jerusalem. And the, the there is also an historical circumstance that can explain what happened. And uh, this is important to remember because I will come to this point when I wrap up the presentation in a while, uh, that apparently Jerusalem manages to expand, I mean Judah manages to expand to the west and to the south because in the beginning it was mainly in the highlands around Jerusalem as it used to be in the late Bronze Age. But at a certain point, Jerusalem expands both to the west, to the Shephelah, and to the south, into the Beersheba Valley. And there's good reason to suggest that this happened uh, under the domination of this uh, same Damascene uh, king, whom I mentioned before, Hazael, who is also referred to in another chronistic verse in the Book of Kings. So this was the uh, intermediate phase when Jerusalem starts expanding, and now we come to the fully developed city. Really, at a certain point, Jerusalem, now think about it, Jerusalem location. It is a God-forsaken place, uh, mind you, located on the southern fringe, you know, a few hundred meters away from the desert fringe. Supply of water is not that great. Uh, possibilities of agriculture are uh, not that great. There is no oil uh, around, <laughs> and no, not even today and no big port or something like that, no important highway crossing the uh, 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 Levant and passing in Jerusalem. So why is it there? You know, what's going on? Because at a certain point in the late 8th century, Jerusalem is becoming the biggest city in the Levant. So it grows. Let me just uh, uh, give you a reminder. Here's the situation. Let's say until I would take a risk and tell you when uh, the risk comes from understanding of uh, nitty-gritty pottery assemblages, okay? But let me take a risk, and then radiocarbon dating. Let me take a risk and say that uh, this is the situation until the middle of the 8th century, until 750 BC, and I'm going to show you now a picture, and you can compare, of the situation 50 years later. So here we are 50 years later. All of a sudden, Jerusalem grows in a, a, a quite amazing way from about nine hectares to 60 hectares and more, very densely inhabited. So the population grows from, uh, what can I say, maybe 2,000 to 1,200 or something like that in a very short period of time. And this is the biggest uh, town, the biggest city at that time in the Levant. So one needs to explain what's going on here. How did it happen exactly? Who are these people? Where did they come from? And why Jerusalem became so important? So for the first time, it is fortified now, so here we have the first big fortifications of Jerusalem, and again, there is no, now you understand what I told you before, there is no need for a, a fortification here on this side, because this is all part of one expansion of the city to uh, the south and also to the west, to include the parts which are now Mount Zion over here, and the Jewish quarter, Armenian quarter and Jewish quarter of uh, the old city of Jerusalem. So there are fortifications and there are elaborate monumental uh, building activities uh, regarding transportation of water, uh, solving the water problem, you know, the Siloam Tunnel, and the very elaborate uh, uh, monumental tombs uh, for the affluent uh, personalities in Jerusalem of the time, and also uh, really the first strong evidence for writing, including the famous Siloam inscription, which is now in the museum in Istanbul that you see telling the story of the cutting of the tunnel uh, uh, in the probably late 8th century, perhaps the beginning of the 7th century BC, but in any event around 700 BC. And at the same time, there is an incredible um, uh, prosperity in the highlands and in the Shefela. So Jerusalem goes hand in hand with what's going on around it. I mean, also the countryside to the south in the highlands and in the lowlands to the west. Now, how can one explain this? 
This is a histogram showing you, showing you the population of Judah calculated according to the number of places inhabited, their size, and then a factor of uh, density of occupation on a, on a built-up hectare. And the, if I have a big mistake here, the mistake goes throughout. So we are speaking about a tremendous growth in a very short period of time. So the question is how to understand it. And I think that there is enough evidence. Uh, I mean, my theories about this are um, challenged by some, but I think that uh, there's good reason to suggest that there was a, a movement of people from the territory of the Northern Kingdom, which uh, had been taken over by the Assyrians in, the, in 720, 722, 720 BC. So people moved to Judah. Why? We don't exactly understand whether there was some sort of a connection, cultural connection still between the two Hebrew kingdoms, of course, which is possible. We are not going to go into this, um, uh, including uh, some sort of religious affiliation. But uh, in any event, what we see is not only uh, the expansion, demographic expansion in Jerusalem and around it, but also demographic depletion in the area that I'm marking here with this uh, square, red square, to the north of Jerusalem in the territory which was ruled at that time by the Assyrian Empire. And this finds also expression in the material culture because this is the first time that we have uh, evidence for items of material culture known in the Northern Kingdom in the ninth century, and they appear for the first time in Judah about a century later such as, uh, I'm giving you two examples here. One example is the um, uh, olive oil installations, uh, mass industry of olive oil, which is known in the north uh, before Judah. And, it, and those installations appear in Judah a while later. And here we have the famous Porto uh, Ionic uh, capitals, which appear in the north in the ninth century, even in the beginning of the ninth century. And I don't think that we have them in Judah before the late 8th century, at the earliest. So there are uh, pieces of uh, evidence for these people coming also and bringing with them uh, their items of material culture. And also bringing with them, and this is something that we need to acknowledge if we speak about this demographic situation. And believe me, it is extremely difficult to challenge the demographic situation because, uh, okay, one can tell me that uh, the middle period is not until 750, but until 751 and a half. So what? I mean, basically, the evidence is there, and we have to work with the evidence. So another thing to remember is the, uh, is the cultural part, which has to do with the biblical record. As you know, I suppose, when we read the Bible today, we can find in the Bible text which came from the north. These are northern texts which have been, at a certain time, were incorporated into the, uh, into the corpus. A very good example is the Jacob cycle, the early layer in the Jacob cycle, which comes from the Gilead in Transjordan. That was part of the territory of the northern kingdom, and there are other uh, northern stories, such as the heroic tales in the Book of Judges, for instance, which are typically northern in character and they take place in northern locations. And there are other uh, uh, texts, including you know, the famous uh, Exodus story, which also probably comes from the north, and so on. So the question is, though th these are kind of um, uh, uh, texts which are how to say, okay, they can be included uh, easily uh, uh, into the Judite uh, corpus, but there are texts which are hostile to the uh, traditions of Judah, such as the soul traditions, the voice that you can hear in the book of Samuel telling not, that not so good things about King David, and then there's a voice answering this voice and saying, well, well, no, 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 let, let, let me tell you what really happened or something like that. So these texts were incorporated, in my opinion, into the um, corpus because of the demographic situation in Judah at the time that we are speaking about Judah, which is Judah and Israel together. In fact, the idea of a great united monarchy of Israel and Judah probably comes from the situation on the ground, but not in the 10th century, but in Judah and Jerusalem of the late 8th century uh, and onward, and possibly also um, 
uh, taking uh, ideas from Israelite uh, ideology doctrine before. And then uh, uh, there is this uh, moment that uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. And uh, we have evidence for the destruction. I'm giving you one piece of evidence. Really now, while we are speaking, there is an excavation going on in the city of David with very interesting evidence for the last moments of Jerusalem under the attack of the Babylonians in the beginning of the 6th century. In many places in Jerusalem, the evidence for destruction is not uh, overwhelmed, let's say, overwhelming, let's say. Not very clear, but there are places where the evidence is strong, including this uh, collection of bule found in the, on the eastern slope of the city of David. So now, uh, in order to wrap up, let me first of all uh, just say a few words, very short ones. I have, I think, four minutes. Uh, I'm, trying, you know, I'm trying to be, you know, on time. So uh, uh, um, let, let me say a few words about what happened after, because what happened after is extremely important. There is a, a tendency in biblical scholarship today to push as many uh, biblical texts as possible into the period after 586 which means into the Persian period and into the early, early Hellenistic. That is to say, starting, let's say, in the 6th century and until uh, the late third or middle of the 3rd century BC. And uh, as usual, you know, one needs to take a look at archaeology in order to see whether this tendency, I mean, has really strong foundations on the ground. So let me just say the following. First of all, there are very few finds uh, from the Persian period all over Jerusalem. In the Jewish quarter, in the Armenian quarter, in the city of David, almost nothing. I mean, here and there, there are still impressions. But for instance, in all this area, there is no single building from this period so far. So far. I'm always saying in Jerusalem, you can never know. So far. And then, and then uh, also in the Temple Mount, the investigation around the Temple Mount revealed the uh, investigations, revealed very little in the way of Persian period and early Hellenistic finds. So then this is important, uh, and it changed this situation, ch and, and also very important to say, while in the seventh century there is this uh, prosperity of um, a scribal activity in Judah, in all media of scribal activity, Bule, Ostraka, and so on. Uh, after 586, all this disappeared. We have a, a group that works uh, uh, under my supervision at Tel Aviv University with mathematicians. We have recently published an article in the PNAS, in the Proceedings of the National Academy here in the United States, showing that we can really calculate, you know, the number of people uh, 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 ca capable of writing in a godforsaken place in the south of Judah, in Arad, in the south. So this is the situation until 586. After 586, all this uh, uh, disappears altogether. And we have almost nothing until the middle of the fourth century, where, when all of a sudden we have here and there uh, a coin. And then this, the scribal activity picks up speed again only in the second century under the Hasmoneans. So, uh, uh, and then in the time of the Hasmoneans, Jerusalem is again surrounded by big fortifications. And this uh, probably took place, in my opinion, in the time of uh, John Hyrcanus in the second half of the second century uh, BC. And then the city again expands to cover the entire area of the destroyed uh, uh, Judahite city of the seventh century BC. So this is something to remember, that we have a problem. My, usually my advice to my friends, biblical scholars, there are some of them here among us, my advice is to be very careful with this dating of biblical text to Judah and Yehud, the province of Yehud, Judah of the time, uh, until the second century. Better to put as many texts in the seventh century, possibly even before, and to the, Helen, to the Hasmonean period, unless one argues for uh, writing in, in the Jewish communities, at that time we can already call them Jews, in the Jewish communities in the diaspora, in uh, um, Babylonia and in Egypt. This is just something on the side. So let me 
wrap it up and ask the following question. This is the most important question to summarize the whole thing. I have uh, already described to you how Jerusalem is not an important place from the environmental um, uh, strategic uh, perspectives. It is not sitting on a main highway, it is not uh, sitting next to a port, no oil, we said that already, and so on and so forth. It's really on the margin. If one looks, for instance, in the southern, uh, into the southern Levant, so of course as a patriot of Megiddo, I would say Megiddo is the place to become important. Uh, Samaria, of course, the capital of the northern kingdom. Nablus, Shechem, is an important place from the topographic point of view, from the geography point of view, but not so much Jerusalem. So how is it that in certain periods it becomes so important? So my answer is that Jerusalem becomes important when it serves uh, the politics and the needs of great empires. Because it was weak, it was left uh, there and it survived, for instance, after the takeover of the Northern Kingdom by Assyria. And then Judah prospered because it served the Assyrian interests. You can see the location here with the yellow uh, square there, location of Judah on the border of Egypt, on the border of the desert, very near to the great uh, 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 roads that came from Arabia, carrying with them uh, exotic uh, uh, commodities uh, to the ports uh, of the Mediterranean. So Judah as a vassal serving Assyria, this was the moment that Judah could really flourish in a meaningful way. And this is the moment uh, in the late eighth century, in the Assyrian century, which starts, let's say, around 732 and continues until 630 or so for one century. This was also the moment under Damascene auspices, I think, in the second half of the ninth century. And this, of course, was the situation when Judah was a client of the great empire of Rome. Uh, Herod the Great was a client of the Roman Empire. And this is a rehearsal of exactly the same situation as we can see under Assyria in the 8th century BC. Still, it is an important place. Thank you.